we're going to have uh, Ryan Scott, uh, yet again, uh, telling, us, telling us about generalized abstract GHC.generics. So uh, let's take it away, Ryan. All right, uh, can everybody hear me? Excellent. OK, so uh, all talks begin and end with Ryan Scott, huh? OK, well, I'm going to continue that trend, I guess. Um, one trend I'm going to break, though, is that the, the previous two talks were discussing things that uh, have recently debuted in GHC. They've, they've been fully implemented and are available. Uh, this is something which isn't in GHC today, but uh, conceivably could be someday. So my goal here is to, I guess, pitch this idea because it, it does tend to be on the uh, mad scientist end of things at, at points, and uh, you know, see if there's there's some truth to be gleaned out of here and maybe it can be upstream to the GAC someday. So the, the thing I'm talking about is GAC generics and how to, uh, well, apply this in a generalized and abstract fashion. That, that sounds kind of uh, hoity-toity, but I'll, I'll talk about what is generalized and abstract about this in a bit. So uh, GAC generics is this really popular data type generic programming library in Haskell that's seen a lot of widespread adoption. and. Uh, it's got this really nifty interface where if you want to uh, scrap a lot of boilerplate from type class instances you frequently write, then it's usually just as simple as deriving an instance of generic from some data type and then utilizing the things that generic gives you to uh, wipe away all the code that you don't want to write. And uh, it works nicely today for certain data types like this, this simple ADT here. Um, so that's nice. But one thing that's a bit awkward is that it doesn't scale up to more complicated data types like this generalized abstract data type, or get it. Uh, if you try typing this in GEC, we'll just reject it outright. And the error message it gives you is not terribly enlightening either. So um, for a long time, I wondered why this restriction is in place. You know, it, it seems like this is something that you should be able to do. I mean, clearly people write uh, code over gadgets that is repetitive and could be easily automated. So why not have generic uh, grant you the ability to do this? So uh, I want to take a look into why that currently isn't possible today and what we can do to fix this. And I, I have a sort of uh, mock design of how you might accomplish this in a way that would be backwards compatible with all the code that is in the wild that uses GEC generics today. So that's kind of nifty. So I. I've been talking about, about GEC generics. Uh, it, it will be a bit difficult to follow the rest of the slides if you don't at least have a, a passing familiarity with what it is. So I'm going to very quickly give you a primer of what this is all about and how you can use it. So at the essence of GEC generics is this type class, generic. Uh, it has an associated type rep, which is like the canonical representation of a data type. And you have these methods from and to, which witness an isomorphism from the data type to the representation type and back. Uh, and I'm going to be using a running example of a type class that you can automate the, uh, the code gen for, basically, using GEC generics. And I'll use NF data since it's the simplest example of a type class I can think of that you couldn't just derive already inside of GHC. And NF data describes how to take some value and fully evaluate it to normal form. Uh, so here's an instance of NF data for lists that gives you uh, the kind of feel for the sort of code that you'd be writing in uh, an NF data instances. And it is have a pretty predictable structure to it. So it's exactly the kind of thing that GEC generics is good at automating. So the, the trick to making this all work is that uh, when you have a derived generic instance, then it gives you a representation type, and it's always going to be basically composed of these four data types in some fashion. I'm, I'm excluding some details like metadata and stuff like that, but this is essentially what it boils down to in the end. And these data types are, in some sense, like uh, reifying the general structure of any data type that you can define in Haskell. So if you have a constructor with no fields, then you can represent that with a U1 type. If you have a single field, you can represent this with a K1 type. And if you have multiple fields, you can use this, this suggestive looking product type to, uh, to select between the two products. And if you have multiple constructors, then you have a sum looking data type to select between the constructors. Uh, here's one example of a generic instance that um, GEC could derive for you for the list data type. Uh, the rep instance is the thing to note here. So list, the list uh, data type has two constructors, nil and cons. So here we select between those with sum, and uh, nil has no field, so we use u1 to represent that. And cons has 
two fields of type A and list of A. So we use uh, K1 for each of those and then a product to select between those two. And once we have the representation type, defining from and to is pretty mechanical, as you would expect. Once we have uh, the representation types in our hands, then uh, writing data type generic code is tantamount to writing code over the four representation types. So if we can do that, then we will have an NF data instance for anything we can possibly think of. So if we have a constructor of no fields, then fully evaluating that is just a matter of pattern matching on the constructor. If we have a field, then uh, fully evaluating that is tantamount to fully evaluating the underlying field. If we have multiple fields, then evaluate the first field and then the second field. And if you have multiple constructors, then depending on the choice of which constructor you're given, then evaluate this stuff underneath that constructor. And that is, you know, NF data boiled down to its simplest idea, I guess, is one way to look at it. Uh, with those instances, then instead of having to write this code that we saw earlier, we can write once and for all uh, the RNF function that works over anything that's an instance of generic. So to make that work, all you have to do is just take the thing, convert it to its representation type, and then fully evaluate that. And that's the algorithm. So now we can take all the code in the instance above and just swap that out with RNF equals generic RNF. And that exact uh, line of code works in a lot of different situations. It work for bools, maybes, ethers, uh, pretty much any data type under the sun. So that's, that's how this all works together. And it's seen quite a lot of success. Uh, but I, I lied a second ago when I said it works for every data type under the sun. It does not, in fact, do this. Uh, it does not work at all for GADTs. Uh, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be talking about, uh, I guess, the, the stuff that is, is new here, the, the, the kind of challenges I need to overcome to make deriving generic possible for GADTs. So we'll, we'll need an example of some data type to look at. So uh, here's one that I just conjured up out of the blue. So we're using GADT syntax here. That's, that's one thing to take note of. Uh, but the thing that really makes this different from the data types we've seen previously uh, is this part. We have some context here that are tucked away underneath each constructor, their existential context. So these contexts uh, are only going to come into scope if we pattern match on the constructors explicitly. To see that in action, here's an NF data instance you could write for that type. Now notice here there's no instance context at all because we don't need one. When we pattern match on each constructor, the NF data constraints will come into scope and that will allow that to type check with no additional hoopla. So you know, it's really important here that if we're going to try and automate this code with GEC generics, that we want there not to be an instance context in the end. So with that in mind, let's try and do what I just said and replace this code with uh, generic RNF. So here's a first naive attempt at making this work. So um, this is some code that I barfed onto a slide, and it, it type checks. Uh, that's, that's cool. Uh, but it, notice there's now an instance context I had to add to make this work, which is very suspicious looking. But uh, we'll, we'll roll with this for now and see what happens. So using that generic instance, uh, you can, in fact, write RNF equals generic RNF, and it type checks. But uh, gosh darn it, that instance context just won't go away. If you try to remove it, it will not type check. So we've, we've lost something along the way here. Um, let's, let's take a, a step back and perform an autopsy and figure out what went wrong. So the, the thing here that's most suspicious is the rep instance we gave for this data type, which is, which is highlighted here. I'm, I'm claiming that there's just two constructors with fields of type A and B, uh, but that's not really all that's going on here. There's, very importantly, there's these existential contexts that were just not, uh, you know, we're not communicating the fact that they're present in the generic instance, so therefore we have to employ awful hacks like uh, writing over constrained instance context to make this work. So really we need to be uh, putting these existential contexts into the generic instance, or sorry, the, the rep instance itself somehow. So to do this, I propose that we uh, use an old trick and add some more representation types. Now this is the nice thing about GC generics as opposed to some other fancier modern day generic programming libraries is that it's quite easy to add stuff to it and have it be backwards compatible through the way that it's designed. So all we have to do is just add or invent a suitable representation type for what we want to do 
um, you know, define some instances for it, and then that's it. Uh, we now have more capabilities than we could before. Uh, so I'm, I'm bad at coming up with names, so I just call this thing x constr for, for existential constraint. Uh, so this is itself a gadget, and it's a peculiar looking gadget because of this, this C variable. I'm, I'm taking advantage of the constraint kinds language extension because this C here can fill in for any constraint that you might be able to think of, be it NF data A, show A, A equals int, uh, whatever. Uh, this is existential uh, quantification of constraints and gadgets as a representation type. With xconster, we can tell how to reduce things in it to normal form. The code for doing this is remarkably straightforward. RNF of xconster, just unpack the constructor and evaluate the stuff underneath it. The thing here that's peculiar is the instance context I wrote here. So uh, we are going to need some fancy whiz-bang technology to make this work, as it turns out. So Quantify constraints become really important here. Uh, I have to write C implies NF data X. I, I don't want to say C and NF data X, because if I did that, then if C were, say, NF data A, like we saw in the previous slides, then that uh, constraint will leak up to the instance context. And that's exactly what we don't want to happen. So here, I'm using a quantified constraint to say, if under the assumption that C holds, uh, NF data X holds, then that constraint is valid. So here, I'm only using C in a kind of local fashion. So uh, C is importantly never going to percolate up to the top of the instance. It's just kind of remain sort of confined there. So with xconster, we can do better when writing this generic instance. So now, we're going to take the code we had before, and this time we're going to augment the rep instance with x consters in each constructor. So now we actually do say that uh, this A field has an NF data A constraint, and similarly for the B field. And once we do that, then updating from and to is just a matter of putting x consters in the right place. And finally, we can say RNF equals generic RNF, and there's no instance context anymore. Hooray! We've now uh, successfully used GAC generics to uh, uh, scrap the boilerplate of one aspect of GADT. So awesome, we're, we're very close to, to bridging the gap here. Uh, so one quick note I want to make is that there's, there's another peculiar feature that GADTs let you do where you can have type indices. So like if we were to add some additional constructor that we'll call gadidx 3 uh, you could say that its return type is gadidx of int and bool, where we have int and bool be type indices. Um, the, you might think that this would be something else we need to invent a representation type for, but as it turns out, we don't. We actually have all the technology we need already. Because uh, we can employ a trick where we take the type indices and lift them out into explicit equality constraints. So here, we're saying that in the form of a constraint, A is equal to int and B is equal to bool. Uh, and these are uh, two essentially equivalent ways of writing the same thing. And what, this is convenient for our purposes because now we have this in the form of an existential constraint and we have the technology to represent this. So this actually doesn't require anything additional. We already have the power to do this. So that's all I need to say about type indices. Okay, so now for the interesting part of the talk. This is where things are gonna get a bit hairy, so bear with me here. Um, existential quantification of type variables is, is the thing that uh, gave me the most trouble when trying to figure out how to implement all this. And um, I'll warn you now that uh, some sacrifices had to be made to get to where I am today, but, uh, <laughs> but this might get better in the future. So, so, so hang on, we'll, we'll see where this takes us. So th the thing here to, to make note of is that we had this existentially quantified type variable A in the sum NF thing constructor. This, this doesn't appear anywhere in the return type, it's completely local to the constructor. Um, so, trying to represent that is going to be a bit of a challenge. And the reason is because, well, if you look at this, uh, this left-hand side of this type family instance, we don't bind A anywhere. We have to somehow reference A without, uh, well, without binding it on the left-hand side like we usually do in type family instances. So, what I want to be able to write is something like this pseudocode here. You know, let's, let's say we have some uh, hypothetical x quant representation type, which I haven't defined yet, but will later. Um, what I'd like to do is be able to give it like a, 
a, a type level lambda like this that says, given some A, I can produce the rest of the representation type. Uh, so in order to be able to do this, uh, we need to find some way of faking type level lambdas, essentially. It's tempting to try to do this trick. Um, it's tempting to try and take the, the body of the lambda, uh, lifting out into a type synonym, and then plugging in the type synonym here. But as it turns out, you can't do this. GEC does not let you partially apply type families. So that trick is dead in the water for the moment. So we need to get more creative. So um, let's get really creative here. Um, I'm, I'm going to be relying on an old trick that dates all the way back to, to Reynolds paper, but I'm using a modern take on it popularized by the Singletons library. Uh, so the code here is going to look a bit scary, but the basic idea is that we uh, reify partial application of type synonyms and type families as, as data types, basically. So we come up with this kind synonym, which I'll call squiggly arrow, to distinguish it from the regular arrow. So uh, this, this squiggly arrow is going to be the, the kind of things that we can partially apply. And we use this explicit apply type family to do so. So if we have our repox type synonym, then we can come up with a defunctionalization symbol called repox sim that has kind type squiggly arrow type. And this is a data type, which means we can match on it with this apply type family and you know, pretend like we're uh, applying it to an argument, basically. So you say, if you are given the symbol and some argument, then to apply that, you just you, you apply the actual repox type synonym to that argument. So with this uh, trick in hand, we can come up with the representation type. Uh, xquant is going to take some defunctionalization symbol f and some existentially quantified type variable x and then explicitly apply that. And that is how we're going to generically represent existential quantification. Uh, and we can write an NF data instance for this thing. Um, Again, the, the code here in the implementation is pretty straightforward. The interesting here is the constraint being used. We're using quantified constraints again. We're saying for any possible x, um, there has to be an NF data for apply of fx. So uh, this would almost work if it weren't for one annoying little wrinkle. Uh, you can't have type families in quantified constraints. Boo, okay. So uh, because of this, we have to get slightly more creative here. Um, or we'll revise xquant. Uh, we're going to apply one of the oldest tricks from the GAC uh, folklore and uh, throw a new type at it. So, yeah, that, that, that's literally it. We just we replace apply with wrapped apply, which is not a type family or it's a new type. Uh, so we have one mental level of interaction, but uh, them's the breaks. And instead of writing this code, we now write this code. Now there's no type families anymore, so it type checks. Whew, okay, that was. A lot of work to get there, so it's kind of ugly, but I'll, I'll talk for a bit how we might improve this. Uh, what? I did run this, yes. Yeah. I, I, I do more than, than try to torture the type checker, I swear. Uh, so so as, as a cost of using this new type, we now have to write one more instance. So in effect, wrapped apply is like a, a quasi-representation type. Um, so. So I've, I've introduced basically three representation types, and with these three, we can generically represent gadgets. So to, to fill in the gaps, now we know what to put it after x quant in this generic instance we were trying to conjure up earlier. It's rep aux sim, um, which is this defunctalization symbol you have to apply. Um, yeah, a lot of hoopla for that. So now that we have this generic instance, we can finally say rnf equals generic rnf, and now we can handle anything that, that gadgets can throw our way. Uh, hooray! Uh, so I, I feel it's my duty here to you know, avoid scaring people in the audience and thinking that now we're going to have to write defunctionalization symbols everywhere in our GEC generics code. Uh, it, this is a, a hack that I had deployed basically due to deficiencies in the type level programming capabilities we have today, but those deficiencies might not be here tomorrow. So there's ongoing work in this area. Uh, Richard Eisenberg and his work on dependent Haskell has described ways you can actually add type level lambdas to GAC. So if that were uh, reality, then none of those hacks would have been required. We don't need all of dependent Haskell to make this work either. We could get away with something simpler like unsaturated type synonyms where you, know, you actually get the ability to have first class parcel application of type synonyms. Uh, if we had this, then you know, we'd still have to lift out these type of lambdas into type synonyms, but at least we wouldn't have to deal with any of that defunctionalization crap. So that would be a huge improvement. 
Um, very briefly, I'll mention that there's some related work in this area. Uh, there's, there's this paper called The Gentle Art of Levitation and an Implementation of an Idris. Uh, this is a system that also lets you do data type generic programmer gadgets, but uh, it's worth noting that um, this requires full spectrum independent types to implement, so it's a bit of an apples to oranges comparison to try and uh, say that this has already done what has been presented in these slides because it's a very different interface than what GEC Generics gives you. Um, and importantly, the interface I showed does not require full spectrum dependent types in um, at least one of its incarnations. And finally, one thing I didn't realize until very recently is that there is a, a talk being given at this year's Haskell Symposium called Generic Programming of All Kinds, which wouldn't you know also offers the ability to write data type generic programming over Gattis which sounds pretty similar to what I just talked about. Um, uh, I, I've only very briefly looked at the paper, so I, what I can say is that it's also using a different interface than GEC generic, so there's enough differences in the presentation where uh, you know, there's some, some comparisons and contrasts that you can make with that. Other than that, I don't feel qualified to say for sure how this differs from my work, so uh, I'll encourage you to watch their talk and draw your own conclusions there. Uh, so for time restrictions, I'll have to skip this. Um, I just want to uh, end by saying that all of the code that I've shown you uh, has been implemented in the form of a template Haskell prototype. So if you wanted to, you could go to this and import uh, some functions and pretend like you're writing deriving generic with template Haskell. So you know it does conceptually work. Uh, as I mentioned before, there are some parts that could be stand to be cleaned up, but I imagine that this will happen sooner or later. So. I'll end by saying, you know, have you ever wanted to write programs over Gettys? Like, I have some simple examples here of that I've been writing to test it out to make sure it all works, but I haven't really talked to many people who've been wanting to do this but couldn't because of technical reasons. So uh, it's hard to test this out to its fullest capacity. So if you have some use cases for this stuff, I'd be excited to hear about this because I'd like to like, you know, stress test this some more. So with that, I'll turn over the floor to questions. Um, so there's, there's two ways to answer this question. There's one you can say yes in the sense that um, anything that you can you know, define with Gadget syntax will work. Now there are other language extensions that do pose some problems. This isn't the slide that I had, unfortunately had to skip. Uh, Rankin types kind of pose an interesting quandary here because they you quantify anywhere inside of a GDT and not just at the beginning with existential quantification. So I haven't quite found a clean way to come up with a representation type for this because it would basically require nesting representation types in places that haven't previously had them before. So there's, there's a little bit of awkwardness there, but um, I, I, I bet if I thought about it some more, I could come up with something suitable for it. Yeah. Could you go back? Uh, I must have missed it when I got off my client and show how you would define the uh, generic instance for RNF for the quantifier. Uh, okay, you're talking about the existential quantification one for type variables? Uh, okay. Yeah, sorry, I, okay. I, I did kind of blaze through this a bit, so here is that slide. Uh, so I need to apply this extra indirection to find the wrap of the Yeah, so one thing to note. Does that come for me? What? No, you've done that for me. Wrapped apply is in the library. I just Oh, yeah, I have defined wrapped apply in a library, so like that part is already given to you. Now, you would still have to uh, write instances for these representation types for each you know, type class you want to scrap the boilerplate for. So you do need to be aware of their existence, is, is the gotcha. But you do it, and then it will get nicer once the type level lambdas come uh, Type level lambdas, or even if we had unsaturated type synonyms, then I think you wouldn't need wrapped apply either. You could get away with just apply effects in the instance context there. Uh, I, I haven't verified this claim. This is purely speculation, but that's what I'm hoping. Yeah. What about deriving for the standard classes for GATIS? Deriving for the standard classes for GATIS. So, does that, does that work already, or do you need to use this uh, It can work, yeah. Like, I, I didn't show examples or anything except NF data for, for time reasons, but uh, 
in the template Haskell prototype I have, I do show some examples of how this would work for, for each show, uh, ORD, and, and related classes whenever it's possible. Now, you say eek, one thing that's interesting is that if you have existentially quantified type variables and they appear in the right places, then you can't derive eek for it anymore because if you tried to like uh, compare things for Boolean equality in the naive way, they'd have different types. So um, if you wanted to do that, you'd probably need to be a bit more creative in how you generate the code. But yeah, it should be possible. Thank you.